The period in Polish cinema that I'm about to discuss, from approximately 1969 to 1975, doesn't have a particular name in history books, but is especially interesting and abundant in accomplishments, and as such is worthy of being addressed. There is a certain, if little obvious, historic justification for discussing it. This was a period that followed the dramatic watershed events of 1968, which in Poland were mostly about the events that took place in March and their consequences. These events preceded the creation of the semi-legal, semi-official, yet distinct, political opposition around 1976. What's both interesting and paradoxical, everything I have mentioned here suggests a high level of politicization, whereas this period, in fact, abounds in accomplishments of a purely artistic, highly aesthetic nature. In terms of the generational divisions among filmmakers at the time, and I will only discuss the best of those films, I will not address the poor examples. Incidentally, there was a lot of complaining about the fall of Polish cinema, etc., at the time. It is only now, with time, that we see how interesting this period really was. In terms of the generational divisions, there are two distinct groups, the young and the old, which I have noted in the title of this lecture. What was known as the young culture, Młoda Kultura Cinema, was a significant group of filmmakers just starting out at the time, those born in the late 1930s and early 1940s. The second group included films by older directors, mostly those of the recent Polish school, who at this time enjoyed an exceptional artistic comeback and breathed new life into Polish cinema. These two groups support each other, cheer each other on, which brings very exciting results. To begin with the first, the so-called young culture cinema, this was part of a wider phenomenon, one that to me seems quite significant in Polish culture in general in the second half of the 20th century. This ties in with the disgraceful events of 1968. Even in those dark days of communist Poland, especially in the quiet 1960s, the first half of the decade, it seemed unfathomable that something like this might occur. That power struggles within the party would turn into such a degrading national spectacle, bringing back the worst demons of the interwar period with its anti-Semitism, with its contempt for others, contempt that was, in fact, encouraged by the authorities. As a result of this, a large number of Polish Jews left the country. This affected the film industry, especially since many filmmakers emigrated, never to return, such as Alexander Ford, who, say what we may about him, did not deserve this fate, a fate that led him to suicide in 1980. Or Jerzy Lipman, who left reluctantly and quickly wanted to return, but was refused. He died in London in the early 1980s. Not everyone was as lucky as Kurt Weber, for example, to have lived to see better times. Today he's free to travel between Poland and the West. He recently published his beautiful memoirs. But what we're interested in discussing is the work of those who stayed in Poland and saw their future here. In short, as a result of the upheaval, I believe we saw something that became apparent especially to historians. We refer to this as the end of a certain unwritten agreement with the government, with all the authorities.
This applies especially to what was referred to as young culture, moda kultura, visible in all areas. From the songs of Wojciech Młynarski, who rather than the earlier songs about love, started simply describing the world in his songs, such as Niedziela na głównym or Jesteśmy na wczasach, which painted a picture of everyday reality in communist Poland. In graphic design, in comic drawings, the old columns with jokes about waiters were replaced by drawings by Andrzej Mleczko, who joined the staff of Polityka magazine, or Andrzej Krause in Kultura, which was very interesting in the 1970s, when the new editorial team took over. The concept was to take responsibility for the world and start describing it. And I believe that the determination in this respect from the end of the 1960s through the first half of the 1970s led to the different perception of Poland during the crucial moments of 1968. With the photographs of glum workers helplessly carrying banners at all those rallies and the events of 1980. This didn't come out of nowhere. This stemmed from working in culture. Now let's focus on the filmmaking aspect of this work. A group of film debuts that changed Polish cinema in the first half of the 1970s. This Young Culture, Młoda Kultura Alliance, I suppose that's a good name, from the capital letters in the name of a magazine that was supposed to be published, but never was, yet it remained recognizable as a name. I haven't even mentioned the cabaret or the theatre, etc. We can't cover everything, so let's focus on cinema. We might divide it into four mutually supportive sections. The first are intellectuals, stone-faced rigorists, who contemplate the fate of their generation in the most serious of tones. An iconic representative of this group was certainly Krzysztof Zanussi, the first leader of this generation. He himself, with his portraits published in magazines, but also the faces of his protagonists. From Jan Mesłowicz, or Jan, the protagonist of Zanussi's debut film, Struktura Kristału, The Structure of Crystal. to Stanisław Latawo, who played the lead in Zanussi's generational film Illuminacja, Illumination. And in the middle, a type of action versus reaction, or thesis versus antithesis, is the assistant professor, a character type created by Zbigniew Zapasiewicz. In all honesty, this character was first created for a TV film called Szansa, Chance, by Zanussi's friend and collaborator Edward Żebrowski. But he became popular through Zanussi's own films, most notably in a TV film entitled Zaszczano, Behind the Wall. These were all films that through their storylines and their depiction of reality addressed the more global or Western problem of being versus having. They always opted for being and contemplated the difficult circumstances of that choice in life under semi-totalitarianism, a sort of bastardized totalitarianism sometimes referred to as socialism with a human face. Which in the first half of the following decade, the Belle Epoque of Edward Gierek's rule, and a rather diverse period, really did show a more human side. A treatise remains to be written about the transformation of Krzysztof Zanussi's image from his 1969 debut to his most recent films. In short, over time, audiences gradually stopped being fond of his work. But that is a separate issue. At the time, this fondness was certainly visible, and his early films certainly deserved it. 
That would be the first point in the rigorous intelligentsia group, or the problems of intellectuals, which were appealing to everyone, as were the early films of Krzysztof Zanussi. Secondly, there is the depiction of the world. This marks a significant transformation in the film of documentary filmmaking, which gradually permeated into narrative films, narrative films that often became paradocumentary. This was the result of the so-called second shift, sometimes referred to as the Krakow School, from the tumultuous events at the 1971 Krakow Film Festival, where the lyrical nature of documentaries from the previous decade were rejected, films representing the Karabash School, with all due respect to Muzikanci, Sunday musicians and other films, with the appearance of a more biting style of documentary filmmaking, outspoken and ruthless towards this new reality. During this period of loosening censorship and a visible approach of goodwill towards artists in the early 1970s, the beginning of the decade of Gerek's rule, the time of the reconstruction of the royal castle, etc., the new government at first appeared to be more generous towards artists. Thus, this more whistleblowing type of documentary became possible. A symbol of this new movement was a film by a slightly older author, Bogdan Koshinsky, a mentor of sorts for these young documentary filmmakers. An extraordinary individual, well worth being remembered. His film Na Torach, On the Tracks, which won the Krakow Film Festival in 1971, receiving the Golden Hobby Horse, was a pure description of reality. Edited, of course, as far as a documentary could serve as a purely objective description. It portrayed the working conditions of people working at train track maintenance, who were kept by the authorities in train cars on the side of tracks in order to save money, to avoid commuting, avoid accommodation costs, etc. They lived in abysmal conditions, and this was, after all, the working class. The film went against all the pompous clichés about the rule of the people and against all the increasingly frequent and increasingly unbearable slogans of the Gierek era. This generation of believers in pure documentary eventually found its leader in Krzysztof Kishlowski. Once he turned to documentary filmmaking at the end of this period, making his feature debut, Personnel, Personnel, this group found its new icon, so to speak. It could easily be imagined that somewhere between the solicitor's look of the protagonist of Struktura Kształtu, the structure of crystal, the one who stayed in the countryside, choosing positivist grassroots empiricism and the face of the young Juliusz Machulski as Romek in Personnel, Personnel, is the image of a certain innocence, combined with the faith that the filmmakers convey to the viewers, the belief that something will change, that thanks to them the world will be a better and fairer place. Third, there is the group of the grotesque mocking, often harsh and ruthless. Here, of course, the most symbolic piece, extremely important for this section of young culture, if made by someone slightly older, was Race, The Cruise, by director Marek Piwowski. Krzysztof Sanusi is senior by a few years. He had a spectacular entry into the world of documentary filmmaking with a group of absurdist films, most notably Muchotwuk, The Fly Killer, his student film made under Andrzej Wajda. <laughs> The culminating point was indeed a race, the cruise, an exceptionally interesting film, as if intentionally messy, imitating the poetics of homemade movies, while ruthlessly mocking the artificially ceremonial nature of people's Poland. Nie podoba się, więc dlatego z punktu mając na uwadze, że ewentualna krytyka może być, tak musimy zrobić, żeby tej krytyki nie było, tylko aplauz i zaakceptowanie. 
tych naszych, prawda, punktów, które stworzymy. Ja uważam, że to jest chyba bardzo rozsądne, co pan mówi. I, i to, ten Tomasz chyba jest potrzebne po prostu. No więc wobec tego należy wziąć się do pracy i budować, organizować. Zgadzam się z przedmówcą. Przejdźmy od słów do czynów. Chciałem powiedzieć kilka słów. Po latach pierwszy polski prawdziwy film kultowy. This later became Poland's first cult movie. I once attended a screening in the 1990s where the audience, members of the Race Fan Club, quoted some of the most popular lines out loud. Especially from the dialogue on Polish cinema between Maklakiewicz and Himmelsbach. Ja w ogóle nie lubię chodzić do kina, a szczególnie nie chodzę na filmy polskie w ogóle. No dzimie to po prostu. Zagraniczny to owszem, pójdę sobie. No fajne to, filmy zagraniczne, wie pan? Już tak można, wie pan, jakoś tak, no ja wiem, no... Przeżyć to, przeżyć, wie pan? Przeżyć. A w filmie polskim, proszę pana, to jest tak... Nuda. Nic się nie dzieje, proszę pana. Speaking of Maklakiewicz and Himmelsbach, this duo often also appeared in films by Andrzej Kondraciuk, who contributed to this grotesque group. He had been present in Polish cinema before, as an actor in one of Polanski's films, as a cinematographer. But he later came on stage as a feature film director with Jurav Ziemi, A Hole in the Ground, and most notably his television film Hydro Zagadka. Years later this proved to be one of the favorite films among young audiences, with its brilliant take on the discrepancy between the false pretentiousness of the new times, trying to appear modern, pretending to be a truly Western society, and the cracker barrel nature and stupidity of public life. Będziemy pili koktajl głuszka. Zdejm kapelusz. Jurku, spokój się. Czytam Time i Epokę. Pijam tylko Balantaina. Palę Winstony. Dla ciebie mam Wintermensy, zagraniczne czekoladowe cygara. Zdejm kapelusz. I po czwarte. And the fourth group, last but not least, as they say, there is the faction of creatives. Artists who, while members of this group, created a new reality, often accomplishing extraordinary feats. An iconic film within this group was the feature debut by director Grzegorz Krulikiewicz, a classmate of Krzysztof Kishlowski, who was at the opposite end of the spectrum compared to Kishlowski's calmness and prudence, bringing an element of madness. Grzegorz Krulikiewicz, who made his debut with such a mad film, truly exceptional, na wylot, through and through, which arguably remains the best in his oeuvre. This film, on the one hand, stemmed from his experience as a lawyer, it created the real-life jury trial described in Krakow's Pitaval in 1932, the famous case of the Malish couple. But what's most important was how he did it. Using his theories, his reflections on film language, especially the theory of the space outside the frame, according to which more should be covered than revealed, in order to unnerve the audience, stimulate their imagination. And the point of reconstructing or recreating this 40-year-old crime from early 1930s Poland was to force the viewers into finding themselves in the position of the people who committed the crime. Rejected, unwanted, with no perspectives. In other words, pushing the audience towards wanting to commit such a heinous act. I kocham swoją zbrodnię, bo to jest moja sprawa. Raz w życiu mogłem 
mieć coś swojego. Bo bez przerwy był mu pokazany i urodzenie, i wygląd, i ci ludzie, i ci mieszczanie. Brakło mi po prostu metody na to życie. A whole group of such films was made at the time. Krulikiewicz was certainly the most unique among these creationists. But we should also mention Antoni Krauser, whose career also started at this time. His feature debut, Palec Boże, The Finger of God, from the same period, the early 1970s, also showed this perspective of madness that begins with rejection. It's the story of a young man, splendidly portrayed by Marian Opania, who dreamed of being an actor and found himself rejected by the drama school admissions board year after year. And this rejection brought him to the brink of madness. <laughs> Czego właśnie nie chcecie mnie przyjąć? Co? Może brak mi talentu. Może, może jestem przeciętnym człowiekiem. Skąd do jasnej cholery wiecie, że jestem gorszy od was? No skąd? Czy, czy naprawdę tego nie widzicie? Że to, co robię z moją pasją. Dlaczego nie chcecie tego wykorzystać? No dlaczego? Dlaczego nikt tego nie potrzebuje? Proszę stąd wyjść i to natychmiast. Ja tu jeszcze wrócę. Ale wtedy was już nie będzie. Keeping in mind this group of names and titles, it was an extremely strong group of first-timers who came into the Polish film industry. The result of their appearance was that their senior colleagues felt that they had to respond. And what's beautiful is that this period of 1969 to 1975, from Struktura Kryształu, the structure of crystal, to Personel, personnel, with Nawylot, through and through, and the race, the crews in the middle, also marked a fantastic period for the filmmakers of the old Polish school. From Kazimierz Kutz's Sul Ziemi Czarnej, Salt of the Black Earth, to Andrzej Wajda's Ziemia Obiecana, Land of Promise. This period also has a light motif, having to do, much like young culture itself, with a more general phenomenon in culture. This was something that in the English language film history terminology is referred to as cinema of legacy. Personally, I call it cinema of historical awareness, though at a certain point I will likely opt for the international terminology, cinema of legacy indeed. This historical awareness refers to a time by which the government had been utterly discredited. A government that the people have long ceased to take seriously. It was a period of longing for what used to be. The entire post-war period encouraged such rejection. We're starting everything fresh. The old class of landed gentry, the sanatia, they had led to the horror of war. It became necessary to search for new values. This was the illusion of the people's culture, socialism, etc. It was during this period that an interest in the past was revived. This became visible in everyday life, in the opening of Dessa shops, in purchasing signet rings by representatives of the people, in the reintroduction of borderland subject matter in literature, 
in the rising importance of historical novels, the return to Poland of acclaimed historical writer Teodor Parnicki, the emergence of Andrzej Kuszniewicz and Andrzej Stojowski in reprinting the works of Melchior Vankiewicz, etc. Historical essays increased in value and quality and were studied by this new generation of young culture. One of such generational reads was Rodowody Niepokornych, which roughly translates to Genealogy of the Defiant by Bohdan Sivinsky. These are stories, biographies of people from the second half of the 19th century who had to live under foreign rule, which served as exemplary behavior for the budding opposition movement. This was followed by the films of representatives of the Polish school, who started indirectly, or directly like Kutz and Konwicki, but mostly indirectly like Wajda or Haas, addressing their own genealogies, telling the stories of their fathers. Andrzej Żuławski, who felt closer to this movement, though age-wise he would be closer to young culture, but in terms of ideology or imagination, he was certainly tied to the Polish school, told the story of his own father in his feature debut Trzecia Cześć Nocy, The Third Part of the Night, based on a script written by his father about his experience of the Second World War. A perfect example of this phenomenon was the directing comeback of Kazimierz Kutz, who, at the beginning of this period, in 1968, prepared the script for a beautiful, aesthetically original film called Sul Ziemi Czarnej, Salt of the Black Earth. Followed by a second part, two years later, Perła w Koronie, Pearl in the Crown. This was a two-part series, further expanded years later, a two-part series about Silesia, about origins, about the fate of people who preceded the life of the director himself. Set during the times of the Silesian uprisings in the first film, and during the time of the miners' strikes, which had a special significance in itself, and served as a warning when Perław Koronia, Pearl in the Crown, was first released in the early 1970s. What's interesting is that these films were so liberal and innovative in terms of aesthetics, expressing utter disregard for the traditional language of the novel by Gustav Murcinek, completely devoid of sentimentalism in its depiction of Silesian families, Silesian cultural distinctness, as if searching for the right language to portray this tribal distinctness. They imposed a vision of Silesia that remains popular to this day, often pursued later by Lech Majewski in cinema, or nowadays by Szczepan Twardoch and Wojciech Kuczok in literature. Incidentally, two of Kazimierz Kutz's favorite young writers. So Kutz was first, Wajda second. A fantastic period for Wajda, beginning with Wszystko na sprzedaż, everything for sale. Wajda's 12 fat years, so to speak, with only a few slip-ups, which are inevitable when you work that much. Almost everything Wajda touched at this time turned out great especially in the period currently being discussed. This series of adaptations of Polish literature, from adaptations of short stories by Borowski, Krajobraz po bitwie, Landscape after battle in 1969, to Brzezina, based on a piece by Iwaszkiewicz, and most notably two monumental works from the first half of the 1970s, reconstructing the same time period of fin de siècle, Ziemia Obiecana, Land of Promise, based on the novel by Władysław Raymond, and Vesela, The Wedding, based on Wyspiański's play. These were spectacular adaptations of classic literature. They did not set the plot in contemporary times, but through their very aesthetics, rhythm, performances and imagery, they suggested to the viewers that the story itself is most contemporary. 
Especially Vesela, the wedding provides excellent examples of this type of indirect contemporization. It is no coincidence that this is the one example of Vida's works that is most often singled out and celebrated by young authors, young critics. Krystyka Polityczna recently published a book on Vida, in which Vesela is named as their favorite. According to these authors, if we are to address Polish identity, it should be done the way Vida did it in the early 1970s, by showing the dilemmas of the intelligentsia at the beginning of the century in a way that someone living under communist Poland might relate to it, the way they related to the limitations of Jacek, traveling with his golden horn, being chased away by the Cossacks, the Germans or the Austrians. Third, there is Tadeusz Konwicki and his Jak daleko stąd, Jak blisko, How Far, How Near, a trailblazing autobiographical essay. Konwicki tells his own story, reconstructs his own history, trying to understand everything that happened during his lifetime, with complete freedom in terms of film language, bringing together the living with the dead. The protagonist is visited by a ghost, played by Gustav Holoubek, etc. This film is worthy of a separate analysis in itself. Wojciech Haas and his sanatorium pod Klepsydrą, the Hourglass Sanatorium, based on the works of Bruno Schultz, was also a feat in the field of film language and made the dream, for which Haas chose to become a film director, come true. To make an adaptation of literature that is completely unfit for adaptation. The work of Bruno Schultz, which is most powerful through language and completely autotelic, and to infuse it with visual power. If we add films by Janusz Majewski to this list, with their references to the then fashionable retro culture, such as Zazdrość i Medycyna, Jealousy and Medicine, or those engaging in dialogue with the cinema of young culture, such as Zaklęte Rewiry, Hotel Pacific, based on 1920s prose by Henryk Worcel. If we add Stanisław Różewicz, if we add Andrzej Żuławski, whom we've already mentioned with his Trzecia Część Nocy, The Third Part of the Night, we get a whole spectrum of truly unique accomplishments. But there was more to Polish cinema at the time, aside from the highly artistic cinema. In the early 1970s, the beginning of the age of Gierek, the authorities wanted to show how rich and generous they are, by taking out enormous loans with Western countries. Thanks to this, a few major budget productions were made, but most importantly, this money was well spent. These films include such epic pictures as Jerzy Hoffman's Potop, The Deluge, filmed over the course of several years and based on the most famous middle part of Henryk Sienkiewicz's trilogy, a five-and-a-half-hour show that fulfilled all the dreams of child and adult readers of this epic novel alike, with impressive turns by the lead actors. Then there was Noce i Dnie, Nights and Days, by Jerzy Anczak, based on the 1920s saga by Maria Dombrowska, which told the model story of a Polish family going through transformation from landowners into intelligentsia. From the 1870s, or even the 1860s if we take the flashbacks into account, until the start of the First World War. Jakie ma znaczenie to wszystko? Co wszystko? Ten świat, te nasze nieprzespane nocy. 
ci ludzie i wreszcie my sami. Rodzimy się, umieramy, a wszystko toczy się dalej, jakby nas w ogóle nie było. If we note that for three consecutive years, Potop, the deluge in 1974, Ziemia Obiecana, Land of Promise in 1975, and Noce i Dnie, Nights and Days in 1976, these films were among the five nominees for the Oscars, even though none of them actually received an Oscar, though Ziemia Obiecana, Land of Promise, certainly deserved it. This certainly serves as proof of the incredible power of Polish cinema at the time, regardless of all artistic accomplishments I mentioned earlier. In order to be objective, having mentioned the accomplishments of national cinema, I should also say a word or two about the so-called state cinema. In this field, there were the multiple feats of Bohdan Poremba, representing a nationalist, state-run type of thinking among Polish filmmakers, and was alone in this for quite a few years. His 1975 film, Hubal, gained the acclaim of a large share of the audience and became a cultural phenomenon, not only as a simple reconstruction of the war effort of September 1939, shining light on the legendary Major Dobrzanski, the last warlord, who, along with his division, fought the longest in 1939, but most notably as a type of worship for the state. The popularity of Hubal should have been reason for concern, and it's easy to tie it to some of the later dividing lines that continue to torment us in modern-day Poland. Finally, we must mention another war epic, the television series Kolumbowie. Based on a novel by Roman Bratny and directed by Janusz Morgenstern. Morgenstern was not given permission to film the third post war part of the novel, but what he accomplished with the first two parts of Bratny's novel certainly deserved recognition. To this day, Kolumbowie is considered to be a credible portrait of a generation that fought in the Warsaw Uprising. Thank you.